This is my lady from for it. Weather modification, geoengineering, harp run weather events inclusive of mega hurricanes, cyclones, earthquakes, thunderstorms, tornadoes, floods, tsunamis, creating mass disruption in world populations affecting millions of deaths, droughts, famines, as well as refugee creation and movements. Wars, death, destruction, attacks on innocent populations in various selected parts of the world, especially the Middle East, propelled by CIA and other intelligence agencies and militaries. Policing and law enforcement transformed into active, weaponized military operations other than war by fusing military and law enforcement goals, essentially to wage war on domestic populations, calling it peace enforcement with non-lethal weapons. Counterterrorism operations domestically linked worldwide under aegis of countering violent terrorism and global FBI operations. Undercover trafficking of falsely named terrorist suspects into multiple intelligence agency, military, academic, hospital, research institution, research projects involving invasive neurotechnology, nanotechnology, surveillance technology, and biotechnology mechanisms. Spraying of world populations with harmful nanoparticulates of metals, viruses, fungi, mold, blood, chaff, calling it first contrails, then solar geoengineering, resulting in a breakdown of immune systems, periodic and seasonal flu creation, millions of flu deaths, and rise in neuro neurodegrading diseases such as Alzheimer's, dementia, and multiple sclerosis. Electromagnetic warfare, the use of harp cell towers satellites to send out EMFs of specific frequencies to depress populations and control minds and moods, now being amped up with 5G, which will permit the tracking and precision assault of individuals with narrow beam millimeter wave weapons. There are many more crimes against humanity committed by these globalist groups, which include terrible crimes worldwide committed especially by the intelligence agencies, and in particular by the CIA, but also by MI5, MI6, the Mossad, and the German and Swiss intelligence agencies, as well as others. Their aims have been, and still are, depopulation, trauma and chaos creation, fear creation, subjugation, passivity, and the depressing of human consciousness. Luckily for humanity, many people of consciousness, conscience rather, and consciousness worldwide have woken up and are speaking out about these many crimes today. Neurobioweapons used in stealth under covers of various kinds, but openly admitted to in reports and memoranda by the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense, are being used in various ways to subjugate people and to induce illnesses and disease. These are remote access human control weapons with known and targeted bioeffects, which also props up and perpetuates the hospital and pharmaceutical industry. Inducing illness and disease in another human along with stress and trauma is equivalent to human torture and subjugation and is a crime against humanity. I just got an email. Ramola D has been locked up in a psych ward. An incredible investigative journalist being held in a psych ward at Kearney Hospital in Dorchester, Massachusetts, How you doing, folks? Chris Haskell here, reporter for Real News Tucson. And I have got a special thing for you tonight. Very special. And I would like to welcome my guest. The woman, she's usually the one that sits on that side of the table. As she's done many, many interviews right under this platform that I'm borrowing tonight. And I'm sure it's different for her, but I am honored to have the pleasure to interview this incredible woman. She is a writer, a journalism, an excavator, and an illuminator, shining light on places which the globalists don't want you to see. 
my dog's jumping next to me here. <laughs> she is a truth teller, a mother, a poet, a creative workshop leader, a podcaster, and a public educator. Uh, she was a faculty member of George Washington University teaching creative writing, and she is an advocate for our continuing freedoms and God-given rights for all living beings. She's written three books, and uh, I'm also proud to call her my friend. Simply, this woman runs a whole darn news station all by her own self. <laughs> I want to uh, welcome Ramola D. How are you doing? Chris. Chris, thanks so much for that nice introduction, extraordinary introduction. Um, yeah, you know, as Chris, the work that I'm doing is not that far different from the kind of work that you've also been doing, right? You've also been reporting for a long time. And in addition to much other else, you should probably introduce yourself as well. Let people know some of the great work you've done. Well, all they're going to have to do is go to Ramola's interview of me. Because I know the people that watch this off of my channel, there's going to be at least 23 people who will watch this. They will know who I am just perfect. But to, to your folks, please watch the video because I am just, a, I don't know, a lover of people. And I spend a lot of time informing the public about the crimes being committed against them by our government. By the way, I don't suggest you, anybody do that right off the bat. They yeah, the, the, they they don't seem to take kindly to their crime as being exposed, but they shouldn't be committing so many of them and all at once and on and on forever, right? Correct. Absolutely. Um, I would like to uh, basically, if you can give me a, a brief history of just, just your family and where you were raised and by who, we can, if we can start with that. Okay. Well, I guess, Chris, before we talked, you talked about wanting to know a little bit about my background, right? So, as you know, I'm here in the U.S. I've been here now about 33 years, actually. I came here in my 20s, so you can imagine how old I am. But um, I came here to do a master's in creative writing, and I come from India, from South India. And uh, what else can I tell you? It's, um, it's a little coastal city that I come from, Madras, but very but very populated, very dense, like all of the cities in India are. And I um, did my entire growing up and studying in the, in the south, both in Madras and in Secunderabad, which is another city a little bit north in another state. But, um, and you know, because we traveled and everything, my father's a geologist, was is now a retired geologist, but because he was working with the Geological Survey of India, he traveled. And so we traveled with him. We would um, go on summer holidays to his camps and stuff. We studied different languages. So I studied both, um, you know, the language of my, um, my mother tongue, as well as Hindi, which is the, a North Indian language, which now is, um, I guess, the official language of India. And uh, what else? And of course, the English, you know, everything's done in English over there in India, thanks to the British. And I went to okay. schools where there were nuns teaching still, you know, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so uh, there was a bit of a British um, influence still. It's a very post-colonial influence, but most definitely, I think it's still there in India, but certainly the time I was growing up. Okay, so, and, and you said you were how old when you came here? <laughs> You're going to calculate my age now. Uh, oh, gee. You didn't <laughs> Let's leave that for another day. Yeah, um, anyway, so uh, <laughs> moving on. As far as the way the way you were raised, um, do you, do you think the way it's a person's raised is important? I mean. Well, I think so. I suppose that's right. You know, I was raised in a Christian home. My family's Christian and um, I suppose a very traditional home in many ways. But that's sort of part of the culture, you know, very traditional Indian family <laughs> with lots of rules and regulations and whatnot. Yeah. So I, I was sort of the rebel growing up, right? Um, wanting to do things on my own and um, not quite being able to, but I did manage to do a lot of things. I mean, let me think. 
I um, played tennis in school, which was sort of unusual. People had to go out of their way to go and find tennis courts to play. So I did that. Um, What else did I do? I would ride a bike to school, to college, and which was close to school. And also a bit of an unusual thing, but um, I'd go jogging in the morning, things like that, you know? So I did do things despite the fact that you know especially growing up a female in india you know with your friends you're always quibbling about how restricted you are and how your parents are always on about you know coming home at the right time and not being seen around with boys and things like that yeah yeah gotcha they're very strict <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah um did you have an incline then to to uh, 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 i don't know how to say it that a growing force to, to tell people about things you learn or were you a reporter at all when you were young? From where, from very young, I was always writing. So I've been writing poetry since I was six years old. Uh-huh. Um, fiction, fiction probably around that time as well. Short stories. I kept a diary, different journals all through my teenage years and stuff. So I always wanted to write. I always wanted to become a journalist, but I always thought that I had to kind of go through a period of trying to understand what life was all about and work in different fields before I became a journalist. But uh, right after my first degree, I did a um, degree in physics. You know, right after that, I actually did do a diploma in journalism and um, spent some time and well actually let me think okay I did my degree and then I think I spent a year working on journalism and then I did an MBA and then I was able to freelance as a journalist and then I worked as a staff writer uh, and then and the, after that after that I also worked you know with my MBA as a management trainee surprisingly in an oil company for a year which actually was sort of the you know, it's sort of the, the jumping off board, the typing off board. It's like, as soon as you get to that point, you realize, my God, this is not at all what I want to do with my life. <laughs> and I was applying to schools in the US, you know, sort of doing the escape act, trying to study anything, physics, communications, journalism, writing, <laughs> creative writing, anything to run away from um, business management. Okay. <laughs> See, that's some good information. And uh hmm I don't know. So as far as when you worked for, when did you uh, work at the at the uh, university? At the university over here in DC? Yes. Oh. So, yeah, so I came here, did my MFA, it's a three-year program. I also had a teaching assistantship. So to me, it was kind of natural to gravitate to our teaching because I'd been teaching for three years during the MFA. And you know, I'd been teaching also tutoring since very young, so I loved teaching. So I ended up teaching at various schools close by. You know, I still lived in the D.C., Virginia area. So I lived in Fairfax, I think, at the time that I finished. Or maybe it was Arlington. I stayed in, I lived in Arlington for about 22 years, really, so with my family. So um, I taught at George Mason University, which is where I went to school. I also taught at Montgomery College, which is a community college in Rockville, Maryland. I taught at George Washington University, and then I taught at, uh, for a long time actually, and then I taught at American University briefly. George Washington University was a place that I um, immediately got a job. You know, it was adjunct faculty, not a full-time tenure track job. It was adjunct faculty, but it was teaching in the writing, Actually, when I first started, I think it was in the literature and writing uh, department of the uh, Department of English, section of the Department of English. And it was only later that I started teaching creative writing. But throughout, you know, I kind of tried to incorporate creative writing into my classes. I was teaching literature, composition, things like that, critical thinking, critical writing, expository writing, that kind of thing, research writing. That kind of wow, thing. that's cool. You uh, never taught children? I, I saw that you're, you know, writing. Uh, well, in college, you know, college I taught undergraduates, and then um, I taught adults through the Writers' Center in Bethesda, which is sort of a continuing education program. I've actually taught a lot of, uh, through a lot of continuing education programs, including through the USDA uh, continuing ed program in DC. But children, I didn't get to teach children until my own daughter was born, right? Wow. Okay. Um, 
we came up here to the um, Boston area around 2011 when she was about six, I think. So she was just starting first grade in a Montessori, and we, she was in a Montessori school. That's not really far from where we live right now in Quincy, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, I noticed that there was a real dearth of art classes in the area at the time. So I spoke to some of the other parents and I started up art classes at my home. And it started that way. I just started um, after school art classes, which then kind of um, expanded into creative writing and some natural science, some astronomy, some, you know, Fibonacci sequence, math, uh, you know, very fun stuff. And the kids loved it. And they were like, you know, seven years old, eight years old. Um, six, sort of that age, it was very fun. And so I did after school classes for a little while, and then I did summer camps for a couple of years. And um, yeah, all of that for a little while. I wanted to continue it. Here, I was I was just thinking that I can see you teaching children. I, I, I don't know if I even had looked up anything about that. <laughs> Oh, you didn't look up anything. I thought you were looking at my website, maybe, you know. Maybe I did. I, mean, I was just thinking, no, she'd be perfect with teaching children. <laughs> I had a lot of fun teaching kids. I'd still do it again. So so where did your uh, writing career come when it comes to, I don't know, dealing with, how you say, conspiracy theories or things that the media doesn't want to talk about? The, the dinosaur mainstream media. Yeah, well, I had my awakening and, you know, in previous interviews, I've talked about this and you may know the story, Chris, but um, while I was teaching my children's classes very suddenly out of the blue, um, I think it was directly after a conversation I had with somebody on the school board in my daughter's school, literally overnight, I started to be um, harassed, stalked targeted in many different ways, wow. including including with EMF tech. And um, for many people, that's a bit of a wake up call as to the, the failure of normalcy in this country, the failure of our freedoms, the removal of our freedoms, and the presence of a real mafiosi kind of element that's uh, running all sorts of programs of harassment on people, but which actually are a cover for something deeper and darker. And obviously when it happened to me, and people started following me in their cars to my work spots. I was teaching at a couple of places nearby, at a school, preschool nearby, and also at an art center nearby. So when people, strange people, started following me in their pickups from my home, pulling into my home street first, waiting till I pulled out my driveway and then following me, that's when I started freaking out and started looking it up to find out what on earth is going on. Is this connected with the Patriot Act? Because, you know, to some extent, I was aware of what was going on in the country, obviously. I was aware of, you know, what had happened with 9-11, the Patriot Act, and people's freedoms being taken away, but not paid it much attention until this started happening to me. And as I delved into it, as I researched, I began to understand what was going on. People were being wrongfully watchlisted for all kinds of reasons. There were all kinds of um, fraudulent FBI informants in communities, in school boards, in schools, in neighborhoods. Um, oh, and you know, I forgot, forgot to mention another thing that I had done, not just spoke, uh, I hadn't just spoken to this woman on my daughter's school board, but at the same time, I had noticed chemtrails. So maybe I came to a very late awakening of chemtrails. But it was, um, let me think, it was around 2013. And I wrote immediately, so I looked it up, you know, I found Dane Wigington's site about geoengineering and stuff. I know, I know you, primarily you have done a great deal of work uh, trying to bring attention to chemtrails, but yes. I didn't know of your work at the time, um, uh, Chris. Yeah, okay. okay. But I found, I, I found a bunch of sites. It was so new to me. The whole subject was so new to me. And I literally, I had seen a white trails from a plane in the sky and I wrote, went home and Googled, you know, white trails crisscrossing the sky. And I came up on the subject of chemtrails and a lot of advice saying, look, write to your senators, write to your representatives, ask them what this is all about, demand that it be stopped. <laughs> so, you know, I'm the kind who has that kind of civic sense and always have, you know, I've gone into those anti-war marches. I've held up signs at animal rights protests and stuff like that. And I've done a lot of volunteer work 
in my time I've worked, you know, as a volunteer in homeless shelters. Um, you know, I believe in social justice and um, I suppose it's sort of a socialist idea, but it's, you know, I believe in helping other people. That's all. That's just sort of a simple sense of helping people and just being against cruelty to animals and things like that. So I've done a lot of that. So when I read this stuff, you know, all this advice, right, you Senator, I promptly did. I wrote to a few people. I wrote to... I think over here it was Elizabeth Warren at the time and Ed Markey, and yeah. there was a guy called there was a guy called Taki Chan. Um, he was the local state representative. I wrote to him as well. So I was suddenly um, I suddenly became the target of a lot of unsavory and unwanted attention right after these actions of mine, writing to senators and saying okay. these chemtrails look rather dangerous and could you please um, you know take you know. We, we're, I'm very concerned and, you know, can you tell me more what's going on and, you know, just just a silly letter, just talking about the health of the populace and please stop doing that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you were learning <clears throat> the amount of trolls and all aspects of when you talk about stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Was the chemtrails was a pretty high up one but you know lots of other things on the internet were higher up the, mm -hmm. they wanted to talk about that they'd get attacked and by the way mm -hmm. we're proud to know that yeah i was a victim of uh, a lot of things okay things i have never even shared yeah. with Ramola because mm -hmm. you know sometimes you learn to not talk about it because if people look, they look at you like you're crazy so you just i just don't discuss it too much either. well I think that's that's shocking, Chris. And you know, people do need to talk about it. I think when we are supposedly living in a free country, uh, when something like this happens, when you wake up immediately and begin to realize, no, you're not. This country is not free for one thing, and two, there's also wicked, evil things going on. You know, people are being suppressed, repressed, and attacked in so many horrific ways. Yeah. And and anyone want to question that? I know this woman that will prove beyond a doubt that we don't have freedom because she was just put in a facility for 72 hours, which turns into being six days or whatever. Okay. So there's my proof for you. Modern day. Wow. You, you, you couldn't get any more incredible and, and intelligent and, and loving people for the things that you do. I, it blows me away watching your videos. This is a step above than I took it. And they killed me or attempted to kill me for the things that I said. Yeah, Chris, thank you. Th thank you for saying that. And thank you for bringing up what happened to you as well. I mean, you were one of those extraordinary activists in Tucson. And I do encourage people to go check out my video interview with Chris. I forget which number it was, which report number it was, but let's find it and put it below this video. Um, but I think Chris talks there about uh, what happened, what kind of attention he drew from local police, I guess, and local FBI, um, and and what they did to him because they weren't so nice, they weren't so friendly. And what were they so riled up about? Chris was trying to educate the populace about those chemtrails and about how the particulates that were being emitted into the atmosphere were harmful to health, right? And you put exactly. up these signs. You had this wonderful business of putting up signs, and you. You have these graphic design skills and sign creation skills, and you were spray painting signs and then literally going and physically putting them up, right, everywhere. Yes, and the, the problem was is that I was successful in doing so. Yeah. <laughs> Over yeah. 30,000 plus signs. I didn't put up five. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did That's just major. Years. Yeah, to where people knew me like they knew their news guy on the but they didn't even know who I was <laughs> mm -hmm. they knew my signs quite well they had little discussions going here and there I don't bother on Craigslist because there'd be all these people down talking garbage about whoever it is putting up the signs <laughs> mm-hmm Always yeah, always. but you, I think you stood out doing that extraordinary task of putting up the signs and, um, you know, sort of 
informing and educating people yeah. about what was going on. You raised public awareness. That's what you were doing. And then that's exactly what you're doing. And and you've yeah, done it in an so. extraordinary way. You're touching areas that, wow, these are hot, hot areas, okay? Folks, and you, you, I think about you risking your life for doing so. Because whether you want to accept this fact or not, these people, I mean, they're not messing around. You know, they bashed my head in with just broke my head into multiple plates with by hiring a person to come, you know, three guys to come do it. And I, God forbid, anything like that happens to you. And, and I think this is good, your attitude of, of keeping it all on the up and up. Let's just tell everyone about everything and, and stop it before it occurs. I, yes, yes. And, you know, I, I'm so sorry that, you know, you experienced what you did. And it so, sort of sounds like the people who came after you were particularly vicious and evil. And yeah. one can only hope, you know, it's always my prayer, Chris, that things are changing and that people are changing. And I always hope that people can change from the inside, you know, because it's yeah. one of the things I've learned. And I've certainly learned a great deal over these eight years of researching, learning how the intelligence mechanism operates, the security mechanism, the military, the, the police mechanism. I've learned a great deal. And um, it's it's my hope always that there is change occurring from the inside, that there are people in there who wake up to a sense of ethics, conscious, conscience and consciousness. You know, their own consciousness needs to expand. Their own soul needs to grow a little bit in order to recognize that um, the way to exist is not to exist in a state of authoritarianism and um, divisiveness between the people and themselves, but more, um, you know, they need to stop what they're doing because really we know what they're doing is there's a lot of fraudulent watchlisting, trafficking to military and intelligence experimentation programs, very dark, lots of weapons testing programs, very dark. Non-lethal weapons testing, that's what I've really focused my um, attention on, what they are calling non-lethal technologies, you know, uh, which they have, they've gotten a lot of terms for it, things like um, crowd control technologies, electromagnetic technologies, spectrum technologies. They're always trying to minimize that they are actually deadly weapons. They buy hacking weapons and neurohacking yeah. weapons, you know, which have bio effects. They have physical damage effects. Um, but they have somehow kept it dark for many decades. They've made contracts with the Department of Justice, and now they've brought it into the police stations, into law enforcement. But And they're operating it in the neighborhoods and communities. And there's a lot of information that surfaced currently about it that gives us enough confidence as uh, journalists, as researchers, to understand that, yes, the fusion centers have these weapons. They are using contractors and they're operating these weapons, you know, and they're using it for uh, very questionable purposes, such as, quote unquote, peace enforcement. Ever heard of that? Nice oxymoron for the day. Not or, <laughs> yeah, or deterrence. They call it deterrence you know, or counterterrorism or counterintelligence. Um, and, you know, they're, they're passing people off as, they're watchlisting people as terrorists and spies. You mentioned you're interested in the Constitution. You're a domestic terrorist now, yeah, right? They took my Constitution off the wall at my house. I never got it back. I, I, I go, really? Really? I had a plaque to one, you know, on the wall. Well, this is one of the reasons, Chris, that I have kind of sought to step out of jurisdiction now that I've tried to understand what's happening. Why is this country behaving like this? I don't know if you've looked into all of that, you know, the birth certificate fraud yes. and the fact that the United States is a corporation, yes. each of our state governments is a corporation. They're operating like, yeah, they're operating like private corporations that um, yeah. are focused on profit. Yeah, I... I for had the opportunity and lots of people have come to me and bring information to me personally after they got to see who I was. That's great. That's so really I, great. I had paperwork about what you were just referring to. That was like this stack of legal paperwork that this guy had brought me about talking about that. Oh, 
Yeah, it was a, very, it was very really, interesting. Yeah, yeah, they don't like people talking about it, but at the same time, you know, when people are treated so badly, we inevitably try to find out why. And then you dig into the history and then you discover, my God, they are actually treating Americans. They have names for Americans as enemies of the state, right? Alien, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they've declared a war on the people. So if you, in order to, to um, have access to your God-given rights, you kind of need to, to find out where we the people is and where the US Constitution is. And then you begin to realize it's not where the corporation is. It's on the other side. <laughs> you know, it's on the land and soil jurisdiction of the United States. Yeah. The true, the true United States of America, the one that your your ancestors, you know, created, not mine, yeah. but yours, because <laughs> you, know, you were born here, right? Yes, <laughs> and I'm definitely one of them, my ancestors. It just throws mm -hmm. me off sometimes, <laughs> getting thinking about how bad off America is right now. It, it just, yeah, I'm not very proud of it. Mm -mm. So tell me, but but, but speaking I, about it openly, I think you know just just to make a comment, I think speaking about it openly as we are doing is really a good thing to do. It's it's the way forward, you know, because you strike chords in your um, listeners openly about such things. We shouldn't we shouldn't give in to censorship because it's not it's not in America's nature to censor itself. It's not in your nature and it's not in my nature either as a writer. Um, and I'm pretty American at this point, but you know, but from coming from India too, it's not in my nature too. But censorship is not a sign of America, you know, and uh, we shouldn't give in to it because the moment you give in, it can be taken away. And that's sort of how I see it. Yeah. And they're, they're messing with the audio right now. But anyway, yes, I was going to um, ask you the next question about uh, about censorship and, and, and when you became aware of it, basically, and you, you've almost covered it, basically. Maybe you can talk more. Well, I guess I became aware of it in 2013 when I became targeted and began to realize that my actions of writing to senators and my as of speaking casually to somebody at the school board set in action, a train of events I had never imagined. I had never imagined that I was in some way special, that I would be targeted in this fashion. Why were people so fixating on me? You know, and I'll tell you, so, so many other things began to happen. The parents of the kids who were in my workshop slowly started drifting away. And I saw evidence, I need to write a book about all this, but the school began to behave very strangely toward me. And there were strange people who came into the school, who I think were local FBI, um, who came into the school and alerted people. So suddenly I was being monitored. Each time I would drive my kid up to the door, there would be somebody standing there and literally sort of giving me to understand they were surveilling me, you know, and they would take it in turns. And it was so bizarre. And all of the, the moms who were the moms of my daughter's friends started to behave very weirdly toward me, uh, pointing cell phones toward me, track, literally tracking in some way, um, sending little notes off to people. It was so bizarre. All those friendships fell apart because they weren't organic anymore. There was a lot of strangeness going on, you know. And, and people um, lying, they, they feed them with information, with lies. With lines, they yes. want, want you know, us to be fighting yes. with our neighbors. Fighting neighbors, exactly. And I learned from my neighborhood at that time that, yeah, somebody had been spreading stories in this neighborhood where, you know, people didn't even know me, didn't know who I was, except they, some of the some of the moms in the in the neighborhood knew I was teaching kids. And, you know, in fact, their kids would come to my daughter's classes too, our art classes upstairs, just two rooms away from here. And, um, but I, I overheard one of the neighbors in my uh, next door neighbor saying, looking at me and saying, oh, she's a, she's a night walker. I didn't even know what that was, to tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to look it up. Oh, yeah. So, um, that is, that's so horrible. scummy. 
Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, so it, they were able, um, the, the local mafia seems to include the local police and FBI, sadly, um, was able to infiltrate the neighborhood and pull um, me as something other than I am and thereby start up neighborhood watch around me, which is really nothing but harassment and monitoring. And, uh, and a lot of noise harassment associated with it. You know, you step out of your house and everybody's got to go get their power saws going or their hugely loud snow blower going or the leaf blower going or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, they do it enough times, you know, it's very timed. <laughs> yeah. and once you see that, once you see that and you recognize these are deliberately timed acts of hostility, you have to kind of step away from people like that because they have lost their minds. Yeah. And, and and you also and you also begin to realize it's part of this larger, you know, what you were talking about, removal of freedoms, larger removal of freedoms that has invaded our um, society, our space, our living space. It's, it's just so wrong. Because I I look at you as being like the perfect, you know, teacher or person that you could trust watching your kids. And and they go around and, and I literally and I they just have. they just went yeah. as far as they could go, you know, like the something that was probably so unbelievable. And anybody that knew you, I'm just guessing here, is yeah. yeah. And and then they go and say things like that. Yeah. Yes, um, I remember talking to friends who weren't here, and they were shocked. They were absolutely shocked that this was going on. But you know, they also be, they, many people are aware, I think, and have been aware around the world of the the loss of freedoms. You know, since nine eleven. Yeah. Both in the U.S. and elsewhere, I think it's been happening in Europe too. You know. Not enough is all I can say to that. Not enough because it just kills me that. You know, all the different issues we've got, you've got, you know, tons of information, lots of <laughs> areas of information, and here people won't stand up for their rights. Yeah, and, you know, when it comes to the geoengineering and the chemtrails, to me that is, it should be the most important thing because it's associated with everything else. With your, it's your breathing. You, it is, but stand up, it, but Chris. And, what? Chris, think about it. I think what's happening also is uh, we've is media. I mean, what do you think of corporate media and the way in which they disappear issues of import like the chemtrails or they distort it, skew it and they present it as conspiracy theory, right? When mm -hmm. there's real science behind what's going on up there. So, yeah. um, so I personally think that a lot of people are um, very misled by media. It's very sad. You can't believe nothing they tell you. <laughs> you check into a few mm -hmm. things and you're going to figure this out pretty quick. Um, that mm -hmm. was another series of signs <laughs> that I did. Did you? <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, they didn't like those. But yes, I did mm. a full series of, of guess who's lying to you game. <laughs> That's don't pretty good. That yeah. On the public middle of the day oh cover that up <laughs> i said a few things about the news yes but they are all liars and they didn't mm -hmm. like it as well yeah i think now with the whole covid mm -hmm. i think now with the covid thing people are beginning to wake, some people are beginning to wake up to the fact that the media is just lying and um you know, making out this so-called COVID to be something really dangerous and, um, you know, the whole virus theory, et cetera. Okay, that's that's a whole subject. Yeah. You know, I cover so this I in my, in my podcast. Question uh, about, and I, I missed my opportunity, but uh, when we were discussing um, the importance, I, I'd like to know, what do you think about how important are you to these globalists, you know? And we we just kind of covered that. Basically, are you aware of your scale that you are? I, I'm. I believe you're high. You're yes. Pretty high. Um, 
Thank you. Well, thanks. But, you know, actually, that's true. And I wouldn't have thought it until recently. I've been given a lot of intimation that they're kind of freaking out. And in fact, they've used that word hot around me and fire around me all the time. Yeah. And um, I can tell you that with this experience and perhaps, you know, people who don't know what all the people have been following, I think what's been happening. I was wrongfully, uh, what is it called? Section 12, uh, you know, grabbed on an involuntary psych hold by local police committing a crime and I have much more to say about it and they are certainly going to hear it. I will be writing about it. Um, but it was a very wrongfully done and it was all on the base of a false charge by the woman across the street, a new neighbor, who yeah. by the way is part is part of the weapon wielding fusion center um, gang over here that's a, that's um, taken up residence in the neighborhood but you see this is this is what they don't like me talking about Chris yeah. go, so recently go into detail about this I'd like to hear. <laughs> let me tell you in recent times I have been exposing in particular the fact and you know I like that I'm very focused on trying to find out what weapons are being used what weapons are being used at, and being hidden as surveillance devices, just from a journalistic point of view, hidden as surveillance devices, but actually being used on people. You know, things, what are they calling non-lethal technologies? And, you know, you find out they are, used, they are testing high-powered microwave weapons. You find out the US Air Force is testing millimeter wave weapons or active denial system weapons. Yeah. You find out there are portable devices for each technology. You know, they've, they've got little ultrasonic devices. They've got very small devices they can operate it from inside their homes but these are not the only things there's there's a literal smart grid we're talking about that we're surrounded by you know there's cell towers cell antennas there's installations microwave emitters everywhere there's antennas on rooftops which have emitters and generators uh, there are generators hidden everywhere and he had operation apparently the this we're in the realm of sensitive class weapons now but they've yeah. been for these devices more and more and more and they've they mastered just, the art they've got them everywhere now right they've got them everywhere and well, they've got they just proved sorry? it i heard the audio you'll you'll see the recording and they just proved it while you were speaking about two sentences back there that what they're doing <laughs> I had some revving up over here as yeah. well <laughs> on the road over here. So, you know, and they've got drones, they've got rooftop drones, they've got hovering drones, they've got satellites, aerostats, they've got a whole bunch of gear, you know, at different altitudes. And they've got these surveillance planes as well. They've got these spy planes, their predator drones, <laughs> their, yeah. you know, I forget what they are. Um, so, um, U2s and MQs and whatnot. Um, I'll have to go back and look. But in any case, I don't I don't take too much of this too seriously. I just look at it all when I'm reading it and I go, oh my God, look at everything they've got. So I'm aware they've got um, layers and layers of surveillance platforms and surveillance devices. And um, they are not just surveillance devices. They are actual, actually powerful biohacking technologies which hit the human body and create health damages all uh -huh. right they create bio effects they have human bio effects and they've been studying it closely they know how to do it so uh, i'm sorry i don't even know what we were talking about but uh, i think well, i was talking about the neighbors right yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and i want to <laughs> say let's go back to like someone's watching this might be a, a client of mine that has never heard your name so yeah let us know what did happen mm -hmm. to you please well um, remember I said I was targeted way back, you know, in 2013, I started to try to find out what this is all about. Mm -hmm. I think, I think what happened was, cause I did a lot of FOIA requests. It didn't go anywhere, but I learned a lot. Planes started coming over the house continuously, literally over my house, directly over, overhead, drones, helicopters overhead. Every time I stepped out, there was a helicopter and there were constant planes so I figured there was this is a US Air Force engine. project yeah sorry a little one engine Cessnas 
Did they? And the one engine Cessnas. They yeah. had those little small Cessnas. Yes. But it was more than that. They had other planes here as well. You know, so okay. I learned about the FBI surveillance planes. I learned about the spy planes that simply stay very high for eight, eight hours at a time. Yep. They come down to track and how they're working. They've got what is called a distributed common ground system. And a lot of these um, divisions of the military have it. The Marine Corps has it. The Air Force, I think, is working on it. The FBI has got its own planes. I think the CIA has got its own planes. And they communicate with ground vehicles as well. So what they're doing is they throw people on these lists. They subject you to nonstop surveillance. They set you up in all of these tracking and surveillance programs. And then they also traffic you into all, you know, top secret, uh, lots of millions for themselves. They traffic you into these DOD, CIA, very dark black ops experiments, right? Which no one is supposed to speak about openly. No one is supposed to divulge any information about openly, et cetera, except as this happens to people, everybody goes online, everybody starts looking, everybody is trying to find out what the heck is happening, and everybody comes up with a distinct pattern. And I have now interviewed hundreds of people who have been targeted. I've spoken to FBI, CIA whistleblowers, DOD whistleblowers. I've read hundreds of books, and I can tell you the way they're doing it is they are 100% locating their contractors in neighborhoods very close to targets, like all around in a kind of 360 degree fashion and operating, you know, whether it's MK Ultra and lots of neurotechnology attacks or whether it's um, one of these uh, Marine Corps, US Navy, Air Force, DIA um, contracts where they're trying to just hit you with different kinds of dues, directed energy weapons and see what happens, you know. All of this is going on in the neighborhoods in America. So American neighborhoods have been infiltrated and taken over. Yeah. And that is the hot stuff that I have recently been exposing, particularly okay. in my neighborhood, because, hey, it's it's happening right next door. You know? Yeah. So, and you, you don't think that affects other people? Of course it does, right? Yeah, they're shooting it does. things at you. It's not just the neighbor they talked into hey, we're going to just put a little antenna to watch the neighbor because she might be a, she does a lot of pedophile stuff. We, we you know, nice things they say. And, and, and that hurts those people too. I guarantee you that. They, I, I've they, heard they, that, you know, I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard that many people who are operating these devices are actually sick of it. And perhaps there's an awakening, you know, as I say, I, I, my hope, my sincere hope as just a human being is that people begin to awaken to what they themselves are doing, to their own sense of consciousness and conscience. What they're doing is they're literally, um, it's assaulting the neighbor in secret. Yeah. Um, addressing weaponry, actual weaponized um, energy on the neighbor's yeah. body. They are visiting disease, health damage, disfigurement, mutilation. It's also very mutilating. Lots of women have, you know, and myself have, have experienced this kind of disfigurement because your face is being sort of being blasted with microwave energy, you know. So um, they're doing all of these horrible things and they're this is um they're engaging in sort of slow kill you know it's almost like a slow kill program yes they're not pe people are not being murdered at once but but these are like terminal experiments and guess who they throw into these programs chris they throw activists journalists whistleblowers anybody who has a spine a soul a heart stands out and speaks for others anybody who's has a humanitarian spirit you know, and I've also heard from other um, human rights activists working in the space. They also target very spiritual people, you know, people who have an energy like a spiritual aura, who are basically just good people, you know. It's, it's which horrible. tells you, which this is, a, this is the people that are supposed to be in charge of our security, right? They call them the FBI. Are they supposed to be like our highest? Uh, legal agency. I'm telling you what, folks, we need to make a, 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 a pact about the FBI. Let's defund the FBI because this is, is bullshit. What they do 
it is unacceptable. Yeah, and they're not the only agency, but they're very, very instrumental. I don't know if you know the work of um, Gerald Sosby. He's an FBI whistleblower, yeah. and he yes. speaks openly about how bad they are. You know, how they've sunk into such infamy yeah. and the they horrors that they're engaging. I don't believe uh, someone said to me, oh, there's a bunch of good people at the agency. And I said, you know what? I don't believe so at this point. I don't. They got rid of the ones that were real because they, they're not going to, yeah. you're not going to back me up and stand behind me when I just shoot someone in the back of the head. Yeah, then, then you got to go. That's the way that goes. And Chris, perhaps we should also recall and keep in mind the fact that it's not just these police agencies and security agencies. It's the guys behind them who are giving them permission to behave and who pay their bills and uh, paychecks and give them the, the authority, I suppose, to behave yeah. in this fashion. You know, yeah. the shadow yeah. government or whoever, the, the banksters, the, whoever is behind them. Yeah. Correct. The deep state, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Yeah, right. it's, it's the few people above, that yeah. should be incarcerated and charged. You know. Yeah. So can we go it back to what happened to you the other day? It just oh the other day intrigues me. Oh, oh, the whole thing. Sorry. That here yeah. you spoke well, on other people's behalf. Tell- what happened to you? Yes, exactly. What I have reported um, as happening to other people is precisely what was pulled on me. So the woman across the street made a false accusation that I was videotaping her children when I was standing outside with my phone in my hand and actually taking pictures of the cherry tree in front of our house. And she literally came out into the middle of the street and spoke in a very denigrating uh, way to me, very loudly, by the way, she was screaming. And she said, don't you videotape my children. You know, the next time I catch you at it, I'm calling the police. And she was screaming at me. And this is a woman from whose house I have actually measured EMF pulses. And I don't just mean, you know, slight EMF pulses. I have been blasted from her house. Um, I see her and I see a couple of other people in the vicinity as being very, very involved in this uh, fusion center assault program. Pickups always come and park in front of her house. And prior to her moving in, the people who moved, who lived there, which was her landlady, um, was engaged in this same attitude, act, action, several activities really, of uh, directing microwave pulse energy at me, all right, and at my house, night and day. And literally, you can tell, you know, late at night, I'm suddenly, I'm being blasted from a certain angle, and I hold up my shield, and I pick up my meter and it's coming from that lit window in that house all right which is directly across from my house um so last summer actually i gave a flyer to the woman the the landlady of that house and uh, made a remark that you know i was picking up these signals literally chris within one month that that couple left they left the house they disappeared but then I learned they didn't sell the house. They they uh, got these new occupants to move in. You know, Mr. Buscat and Blondie, the wife. Uh, I don't know their names. <laughs> so, their tenants. And uh, with three kids, I think. They just moved in. Imagine who would, with their children, move in across the street from somebody and take up a job, uh, you know, with the Fusion Center to actually engage in this kind of constant tracking yeah. and constant... Constant using of microwave pulses against that person. Who would do that? But there is a whole subculture of people who are doing this. They are connected with security, law enforcement, and the military. And they are their thinking is very foreign to ours. We do not do the kind of things they do. They are engaging in aggressive actions of stealth, assault, and battery using electromagnetic spectrum technologies. So you can't speak openly about it. So as soon as you speak openly about it, you're going to be called mentally ill by them. That's the system they have set up. So that's what happened. So that's what happened. I think a couple of days prior to her, uh, you know, attacking me. I, that's exactly what happened. A couple of days before she attacked me in public, I had been speaking on the phone saying this woman across the street is engaging in this because I've picked up signals from her. And, you know, she, uh, she needs to stop using microwave weapons. She overheard me. She said something to my husband that day, that time. And, you know, I think he said something to her. Two days later, she's screaming at me to stop 
videotaping her children. I told her, stop using microwave weapons on me. And I literally shouted back at her. You know, she is the aggressor, not yeah. the public defamer and public slanderer standing in the middle of the street and telling me to stop videotaping her children. I wanted to point out that I was certainly not videotaping her children. I said, why would you think I'm videotaping your stupid kids? Sorry, I said stupid kids, you know. So, um, yeah. I, and so she said, what weapons? And then she was recording me. And that recording, by the way, so here's what happened. Literally shortly after the police showed up and then they showed up the next day, they deceived my husband and he opened the door and let them in. They deceived him, telling him that, you know, I was seriously mentally ill and I needed to be brought into the system. And they had a little program set up and they would just be, first, you know, take me and I... Okay, that's another story I can't go into publicly right now, but my husband was deceived. Let's just leave it at that, all right? And um, he unfortunately let them in the door. I tried to get him to close the door and kick them out. He wasn't listening to me. He ran upstairs to answer a phone call. They captured me all the while I was telling them, look, you don't have my consent. This is against my will. And you don't have jurisdiction over me because I have removed myself from US Inc. jurisdiction. I can assure you of that. I have become an American state national. So I t tr told them that. They pretended not to hear. They called an ambulance. Lots of manhandling, grabbing, pushing me out of the house. All the while I'm telling them no consent, no, no jurisdiction. You're not under arrest while they're pushing me into the ambulance. What does that mean? You know? So I was being detained falsely on a false claim from this woman, which I didn't even learn about until I went to the hospital and I heard a nurse saying, oh, she's filming kids and posting it on Facebook and she thinks that's okay. I came out of the bathroom, I was in the restroom and she was yelling. And I came out and said, excuse me, were you the nurse talking about this? And did you just say that? She said, yeah, I said that. I said, well, let me assure you, it's an absolutely false claim and it's a big fat lie. You know, and this just proves my point that I'm being brought here on a false claim, on a baseless allegation. And um, so, of course, I made a big, you know, furor in the ER. I tried to uh, really get them to let me go. They would not. They were absolutely adamant. And they literally froze me out in the ER for a couple of days. I was freezing, starving, you name it. I have to write at length about this. It was outrageous. Kearney Hospital, Dorchester, ER, you know, absolutely outrageous. And... Um, People I called were giving me conflicted advice, you know, call 911, walk out of there. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that was my dog. Or call the Boston FBI. So I called the Boston FBI. Boston FBI, actually. Oh, that's all right. So I had, um, explained I was kidnapped, but, you know, they took my information. They said, well, we can't really do anything. You know, it's a section yeah. 12, so it's like they, they seem to be part of it. But in any case, they said we've taken the information down. I said, you need to investigate it because this was a false claim. You know, that's yeah. what I'm reporting. It was a false claim. You know, you're, you've just picked people up off the street on a false claim. So there were many, many things wrong about this. And, you know, I'm, if this were, um, I'd like to talk about this another time, a different time, because the whole issue of mental health and mental health holds is so faulty. Was that your cat or your dog? That was it's so blurry, but it's a little dog. The little chihuahua she wanted to be. Chihuahua. Oh, that's <laughs> cute. <laughs> but keep going. Yeah. I don't mean to throw that off. So I think this whole mental health issue thing is, is a big deal because if there were somebody having some kind of mental health crisis, what they did was severely traumatizing. That person yeah. would have had a meltdown and, you know, just freaked out or whatever would have been very upset i think would have been very very upset because what they did was very um upsetting it was very sort of in your face very sudden creating a crisis you know sort of manufacturing a crisis and um ambushing people ambushing my husband telling him lies and then crowding it on me and grabbing me all that stuff is super dramatic and super dramatizing i just happen to be super level-headed and, you know, I, and I'm and i capable of standing up for myself, which, I, which is what I did. But um, think of this happening to, say, a 16-year-old or a 20-year-old or somebody very young and 
who doesn't know about the stoa, somebody who really is in a kind of unhappy, anxious, depressive, whatever, some kind of mentally unstable state, you know? How would they have reacted to something like this? So what the police are doing is outright evil. It is aggressive, it is uncalled for, it is very wrong, and there's no mental health associated with it. Nothing. Yeah. It, it's, it's very unhealthy what they have done. It's unhealthy, it's also criminal, because they don't have a right you know, to just tr trample people's rights like they did. Yeah. So they are going to hear from me. Yeah. And, and they put you, they would have attempted you to become crazy. This is exactly what they do. They put you in a circumstance that was horrible. You described it to me. And, you know, it's not even, they have no uh, conscious here because they, these people want to send someone over the edge. And like you said, uh, someone Correct. else may not be able to handle it. And I want to get it. And I'll tell you, nobody. When they when they come and you've been messed with an audio so far multiple times you'll you'll see in the recording but they're they're proving the point while they're doing this it doesn't happen when we're talking about the PTA or talking about stupid stuff it it doesn't happen and and right now your camera's blurry by the way but whatever you know we'll all get over that <laughs> so yes I will I will. Yeah, I'm, I'm determined to speak openly about this experience and extensively about it to anybody who wants to interview me because I think everybody needs to know. And I'll tell you, um, they gave me as a journalist an insight, an insider's look into how they are running these so-called mental health holes, okay? Where they're running it, what kind of institutions they're taking you to, yeah. and what exactly happens there. I've seen it all now. And it's yep. literally like, you know, a little hellhole that they take you to. And everybody who is there is having mental issues just being there because it's such a horrible place. Right. You're watched all the time. You're monitored all the time. You're surveilled all the time. You're listened to all the time. And you're treated like a child. You have to ask for anything you want, like a glass of water. Right? And if you yeah. need to do your laundry, you need to go and find somebody and beg him to open the laundry door. And he won't just open the laundry door and leave you to it. He has to throw his weight around. He has to open the doors, stand in the door. So you have to squeeze past him. I mean, what is that? And then he has to tell you exactly, you know, step by step instructions. Do this, get your clothes, put it here, do that. I mean, to grown adults, all right? Incredible behavior from some of these. Oh. And these guys who looked like hefty prison guards, I call them prison guards, um, in my head, they were, <laughs> they were given the noble title of mental health counselor. They're, they're neither mental health care workers nor are they counselors. Yeah. Some of them, some of them were, you know, you could talk to them. Some of them were just authoritarian fascist types. Yeah, and, you know, you just kind of had to marvel at it. It's unbelievable how this is important. You kind of froze out for a minute there. Yeah, yeah. I said it's unbelievable how this is important to them to do this. They spend a lot of money. It is. It is, and you. They spend a lot of money and I was told, you know, I haven't yet gotten the bill in the mail yet, but everyone's telling me, just wait till you see the amount, you know, and it's like, I'm sorry, I'm not paying for this. This was, I was dragged there against my will. You know, that bill is going straight to Quincy Police Department. They can pay for yeah. it themselves. Yeah, this and, was a crime that they've been acted on my body. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I do want to mention one thing that, uh, folks, this is, this happened to me, okay? except I was on the other end, they kept coming for me and I'm like, whoa, you know, I, <laughs> they never got me. Okay. But they came for a year over a, apparently I find out later they had a 72 hour hold and they tried, they tried like a Dickens. They gave it a good, a go. I said, bring it on. Come on. Do me again. Cause, and so <laughs> I mean, it did. after the third time I went to the police department and said, Okay, ma'am, go ahead and arrest me. Get me going here. I'm gonna, you're gonna need to arrest me. And she looked it up. And she says, 
she laughed and said, I'm sorry, but I can't arrest you. I said, why? And she said, because you don't have a warrant for your arrest. So they do this with no warrant. And that and that's the way I treat they it. They do it with no someone, warrant. You ain't got a warrant. Good luck. Knock all you want. And they'd come and they'd bang on the windows. My dad lived there with me. And he'd be freaking out. What do I do? I go, just pay no attention to it, Dad. Just let it go. You don't let them in. And this is something yeah. my husband didn't know. You do not let them in. There's no yeah. call for them to come in. Later on, Chris, we found out this woman didn't even make, there was no police report. Yeah. Can you believe it? I oh called the police God. department. There was no police report. It was like an anonymous call. She didn't give her name. She didn't give my name. So what do you think? You think this was an inside job? Yeah, sounds see? to me like it was. What do you think? Uh, you, mm -hmm. you think our, our viewers, would, would they think they can call about their neighbor and they're going to come and do this? No. It's not going to happen. It, if anybody calls, they, they just like ignore you. And so why did this happen? Yeah. It's because who you are. Uh, your audience. They froze you out completely. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I think because of who I am. They froze you out completely, by the way. Yeah. And it's, you know, when Yeah, people... I didn't hear a thing. You kind of froze video. Your video froze completely. Yeah. Well, you know, when people that are viewers, if they, let's say they, just call their neighbor and say, I see some stuff going on over here. I don't like this woman. She seems crazy. They aren't going to do nothing about it. Okay. I, I've had situations like that. And they don't do nothing. They barely listen to you. So they're certainly not going to do what they did to you for that. No. No. Unfounded to begin with. And now you say that there wasn't even a, yeah, because they looked at it and said, get rid of that. Oh, shoot, that ain't going to hold up in any court of law. <laughs> yeah. And that's what yeah. And you know what else? What else is really interesting is that um, I showed the psychiatrist over there. I spoke to three psychiatrists over there, and I was impressed by a couple of them, not not one of them, but uh, the, not the third, but, but two of them are really good people and smart. And um, one of them is a woman, and she told me she had a military background. She looked at the form, and she looked at it with a nurse practitioner who also spoke to me. And they both said this is highly irregular because it's a mental health form from the Department of Mental Health of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that's their little setup, right? They run off and get the mental health form. It's signed by a police officer, though, and the write-up, is in a different handwriting and uh, i know what happened there were there was a guy there were three people who showed into, uh, in our showed up in our house um one of the cops went off and did the calling of the ambulance and whatnot the other cop hung out and uh, tried to intimidate me inside the house the um then the third guy asked him who he was he said his name was tim o'brien and he was uh, with the mental health department i said oh i see and uh, later I didn't speak to any of them, okay? Beyond asking them who they were, I didn't speak to them. I spoke a bit to my husband who was unable to take in anything I was saying because he was so confused, I think. In any case, um, they wrote up on the form that I had had an interview with a clinical correspondent. Big mm -hmm. lie, never had an interview. Nobody introduced themselves as a clinical correspondent and I didn't have an interview with them. There was no interview. There was a lot of craziness, crisis creation, stress creation, shouting, bullying, intimidation. Okay, there was no interview. And I didn't speak to them. Secondly, they wrote a list of patient reports, this patient reports that patient reports that microwave weapons are going through her body. Sorry, I speak and write better than that. And I never say things are going through my body. <laughs> <laughs> that was made up and a whole bunch of other stuff is made up and you know a casual remark I threw out about you know these guys are real you know Freemasons is what I said to my husband look at look at how they're standing so they took that and they wrote it up as patient accuses has a acute agitation and accuses QPD Quincy Police uh, Department officers of being in a satanic cult Perhaps they are. I don't know, but I certainly never said it because I have no information on that. I bet so do you see how they just? Dis yeah. They distorted. They distorted, fabricated, bullshit, <laughs> and wrote utter rubbish on that form. Okay, that was utter rubbish. And then, uh, and this guy said it to me: parent delusions, grandiose delusions, acute agitation. People who speak apparently are considered acutely agitated. 
Acute agitation, inability to have complex insight or ideation. Why would I have complex insight? <laughs> there are three thugs in my living room. I would say get out, <laughs> please. <laughs> so a lot of rubbish, a lot of lies, and Almost, they did almost everything to try to justify themselves as being in the presence of somebody who was so demented that they needed immediately to be transported to a hospital to oh. be observed for three days. Yeah. Unbelievable. Incredible. And, and Absolutely incredible. So in any case, the psychiatrist who saw this said, you know, it's very unusual and, you know, they've ticked off all the wrong boxes. This police officer has no right to examine you, so he cannot sign that form and as well as uh, check the box that says I've examined the, this person. You know, he's a police officer. He can't examine somebody and uh, sign off on a mental health form. Yeah. Right. So a lot of irregularities like that, you know, and add that up to the fact that there's no police report. It was an anonymous call. Uh, uh, you know, clearly uh, a little crony of the police station here next door. Yeah. I guarantee they had some kind of police report. They just, somebody looked at it that was intelligent and said, get rid of that. <laughs> I don't want anybody to see that. <laughs> Very interesting because I have done a FOIA request now. I've put in a FOIA request to the QPD and to Mass State Police. I have to check online to see if there's been any response from them as yet. But tomorrow's Monday, I will do a check. Yeah. yeah. I need to definitely let the police station know that this woman put in a false claim. You know, I need to let them yeah. know that. What about charges and, the other way? Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. And, and they need, while, yeah. While we're here, I would like to cover this for legal reasons, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> uh, tell us your thought about suicide. Are you going to commit suicide after this? How do you feel? I'm about sorry, I didn't quite catch the whole thing. I, I wanted to put this disclaimer on this video. Uh, when you go ahead and kill yourself tomorrow, you know, that we are pretty clear that <laughs> what? How, what is your. Oh, oh, thank you for asking me that very important you, question. I wonder. Yeah. If you Yes. I wondered if you meant it in the spirit of, you know, the psychiatrists at this section 12, because they all ask you that question. Have also. you ever thought of harming yourself? What oh, do you yeah. think of suicide? What do you think of homicide? Et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's like, please give me a break. I've got a very full, engaged, happy life. I've got a daughter to take care of. I have a family life. Yeah. I've never been depressed in my entire life. So if to put it out there, should anything happen to me tomorrow, Please be assured it was not suicide. I love life too much. And I love my life too much to ever imagine that, you know, I would ever go there. I would never, I never, not even a thought. If anything happens to me, I think. They cut your audio. They were a little late, though, I think. Okay. They said, well, we've had enough of this interview. Shut her down. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Hello, Ramola. See, this is exactly what happens. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm here. I can hear you, but I can't. You've You're frozen. Back. Your video's frozen. Oh, mine is? It, it looked to me yeah, like yours. Yeah, you... that's what they do. It looks like the other way around to the other person. Yeah. Okay, so no, no worries. Oh. Is it recording? What happened? Wow. Because, folks, this does not happen on your everyday average situation. It doesn't. This is what they do. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm froze or she is, but I can't see nothing. I can hear you now. <laughs> ah, they're they're working hard on your behalf. They're working. They we'll, really are. We'll I tie this up. Why. We have gone quite a ways, but um, this has been great. And they have proven our point beyond a shadow of a yeah. doubt.
Yeah, it's amazing. My mic was off just a minute ago. Now it seems my mic is on, but yeah. the camera is off. Your camera's mm -hmm. not on, yeah. There you go. Oh, now there we go. The woman right there. She's back. <laughs> I hope this whole yeah, Well, I think we've had... Recorded. Will it be? Uh, it's all been recorded. Yeah, the whole thing's been recorded. Um, you know, I think it's been... A very candid conversation, unexpectedly candid, right? But um, but Chris, you are an informed interviewer, and as I said earlier, I'm grateful to speak with people who know what's going on. You know, who know what's going on in this country, who know what's going on in the police departments, and who know that innocent people are continuously being targeted and um, being harassed by the law enforcement, security, intelligence, military mechanism in this country. Yeah. Which is what I experienced. And are you, if, if I'm correct here, I think she has a way that people can and go and support her journalism. Um, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Go to Patreon or PayPal and donate. Because all you have to do is watch three, five, seven, 42, whatever, her videos, and you'll understand how important it is to support this woman. Because, it, I mean, all honesty, this is your last chance to be informed, I think. Look at, look at our news, okay? Very, people like Ramola are very important on the scale, folks, very high to those people, to the globalists. And they don't want them to be out there because there's only a handful of people like yourself, just a handful. So um, I want to say yeah, that. I, I, I hope you have a way that supporters and people can support your journalism because that's what needs to happen here. That's that's the only choice we have. To, to And when you get crowdfunded journalists, you're going to finally, you're going to keep the real news it's the only way is my belief that would be nice if more people <laughs> kind of yeah. crowdfunded and support my work yeah because i could i could continue to keep it open i've always believed that information should be journalism should be i don't i was hearing your audio cut out but it could be just me but Anyway, there's our, our FBI needs to be defunded. That's a fact. Not the police. We need to defund the FBI. Are you there, Ramola? I am. I think what they did was as I was speaking, they cut me out. So I don't yeah. know if you heard anything I said. Right. They cut you out. And why is yeah. your and folks, this is not, I don't believe this is just errors. This happens every time I've ever done an interview. Uh, seriously. And if I do nothing playing around on the camera, you can, you'll never have trouble. It's no problem. Well, Ramola, this is a great interview. And I, I totally appreciate, I appreciate the, the, just let me do it. You're very welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for speaking with me and for asking these questions and sort of, you know, hosting this discussion because I think it's um, very rare to be able to speak openly and um, I'm glad we had a chance to do so tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you. Have a good night. You're very welcome. Good night. Just clicking stop recording.